So welcome. This is our cloud funding panel. So we've gathered an awesome panel. And it's a small crowd, so I'm gonna gonna Feel pick to out up. names. Okay, and I get the questions. So let me just introduce the panel. It's a, it's a, these are all Barcelona-based, either VC communities or founders of their own startups. So how many are startup founders here looking for money? No one. <laughs> Aspiring founders. <laughs> Aspiring founders? Looking for advice. Looking for advice. How awesome. OK, so let me introduce the panel first. Um, I have Guillem Sage. He's the investment manager at Nata Capital. They're the same ones that invested in Abaco, which is like a cloud management startup. <laughs> and others, and I can show you. Um, I have Alex Maloff. He's the managing director and head of growth for Harbor Space, Har Harvard.space or Harvard Space? Well, I mean, it's uh, Harbor.space, but I mean, we call it Harbor Space. Mm, OK, Harbor Space. I'm going to give you a few minutes to talk about each of your areas, but I'll just kind of get everybody started. Um, Scott Mackin, he's the founder of Barcino. So if you read up on the, the startup scene about Barcelona, that's how I figured out this thing. I, I had not ever been to Barcelona. Okay. And um, Scott, he's like all the editors and all the articles about all the cool startup scene, that's from Scott's company. And I met Carlos, actually. Uh, something's wrong with my laptop. Hold on one second. Oops. Almost snuck that away. Um, I met Carlos. He's the uh, person who's responsible for Startup Grind um, in Barcelona. He's also the founder of Liam. OK. Right. <laughs> so my, tell, hi, my name is Susan Wu. I'm the director of technical marketing for Mitokura. So Mitokura is a 50-person startup. We are based in Switzerland. Um, we have um, engineering offices in Tokyo, Barcelona, and San Francisco. Uh, we're a network virtualization overlay company, and we're the certified um, Neutron plugin um, for networking. So with that, I'm going to let each of the panelists talk more about their areas, and then I have some prepared questions as well, and then I'm going to let everybody like ask their questions since it's, it's a small crowd. Guillem, do you want to start? Okay, sure. So uh, my name is Guillaume Sage. I'm, as she said, investment manager at Nauta Capital. Um, Nauta Capital is uh, an international VC fund uh, with roots in Barcelona. That's where we started. But we're currently in Barcelona, in London, and Boston. We have offices and three locations, and invest approximately one third of our funds in each of those, um, from each of those locations. What we usually tend to look for are what we call companies that are capital efficient. Um, this doesn't have to do with how much the founders earn. That's, that's not the point. The point is um, how much money we think the companies will need to become something important in their industry. And we tend to find those companies mostly in the B2B software space. Um, we started 12 years ago doing basically on-premise software. Um, and now, obviously, all our companies are in the cloud. Alex? Um, so uh, my name is Alex, and uh, harbor.space. Space is actually a TLD. I need to explain it, because people put .com and up, end up at NASA. Um, so we are actually a, a university um, based here kind of in Barcelona. Um, we are hyper-focused on uh, tech education, uh, very high level, um, because we run uh, a uh, data science program, cybersecurity <laughs> program, and computer science programs developed together with, say, like Spersky Labs and Yandex Data Factory, so they're very, very high level, hard to get in. Um, I'd like to think we are in ed tech space, because we're changing a lot about how um, universities operate in terms of approach to education. And in addition to that, we also run uh, a lot of uh, initiatives. Uh, like we have a uh, conference on uh, data science. Uh, and coming up in February, we are running a boot camp here in Barcelona to prepare teams for ACM ICPC um, competition. Um, and that's essentially kind of the foundation of what we're doing right now. Uh, great. My name is Scott Mackin. I'm a, I'm a U.S. expat, uh, now based here in Barcelona, uh, but originally from Boston, and I spent some time in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado, as well as L.A. and, and San Diego. Um, I'm involved in a, a number of projects here, mostly around digital marketing uh, in, in specifically with B2B startups. Uh, but one of our uh, more popular uh, projects is Barcino, which is um, uh, an international tech platform focused on Barcelona's 
startup and innovation communities. And what we've kind of become over the last few years is um, a de facto landing zone for any non-Spanish speakers around the world that have some sort of professional business interest in Barcelona. So we kind of become like a, a two-way communication channel uh, between Barcelona Tech and, and the global business community. And my name is Carlos. And on the one hand, I organize events at EGM, so to help companies connect with their uh, stakeholders in a personal way. And as Susan mentioned, I'm co-director at the Startup Grind Barcelona chapter, which uh, is a global community of entrepreneurs to connect, inspire, and educate them. Basically, uh, we work on a local level and help people connect within the community and with, with the international communities. So recently, Barcelona has named the new Silicon Valley. I stole the slide. But look at all the investments in, across the areas. And the funding amounts weren't small, like up to 30 million. Uh, is that uh, euros? It's still very, very significant. And then um, I, I saw uh, the investments were all across the board, whether it's enterprise software, cloud management, uh, some SaaS companies as well. So um, look into your crystal ball. What, what's the hot stuff and what's not hot so that we don't tune our companies to what's not getting invested. Um, there's a view in the Silicon Valley. They actually invest in things that are so early like five years ahead, so they're investing in like AR, VR. And I don't think there's a whole lot of commercial applications, but what's the scene in Europe? Uh, what's the scene in Barcelona? Any, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so what, I, what we've seen in the last couple of years is um, kind of a fintech bubble. Um, you start seeing fintech companies popping up from everywhere. Um, many of them do not do anything different than what's, um, what's, what the others are doing. So that's what, what happened in the past and probably is going to slow down. And so I, what I think that the next logical step is that the insure tech companies pop up. So I expect that in 2017 we'll see a lot of investments in companies doing insurance technology. Um, Did you say insurance, insurance technology? technology. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's like the would we see like the next hot stuff? Um, is, is that um, Barcelona, Spain, or is that all of Europe in, in general? I think all, all in Europe, but usually in Spain, you tend to be six to 12 months after Silicon Valley, and, and then maybe six months after London. So you can kind of see what's happening there, and then you know what's going to happen here. So it's, it's easy uh, to say. There's your crystal ball. Just look at Silicon Valley. Yeah, and then, and <laughs> that's, that's easy I, to say. I, I think it is happening quite like that, but I, I think there's a difference in the Barcelona uh, VCs that I noticed. So there's a, some of them are taking firms from Europe and then taking them, taking them to the US. So a bunch of, uh, and I saw that with French nationals. So they would actually not start the company in France and they would immediately take it and, and headquarter in the US. Is that what's happening in the Spain scene or they're keeping the companies in Spain? Fortunately, we're moving into uh, keeping the companies in Spain. When I first came here, it was very much the, uh, the place, Barcelona is a great place to um, build your team, build your prototypes, test, 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 try and find product market fit. And the second you need to raise money, go to London, go to Silicon Valley, go to New York and, and raise, uh, raise a big round uh, outside of Spain. Um, in the past couple years, two to three years, we've seen a, a number of um, larger, you know, more kind of traditional Series A type investments happening here in Spain. C Spanish companies kind of planting their flag and saying, no, we're not leaving. We're going we're gonna to build here despite some of the the Spanish bureaucracy and challenges that that, that imposes. Um, you know, as far as the, the crystal ball thing, and this isn't just Barcelona or, or even Silicon or even Europe, um, although we're seeing it here, is I think um, AI startups are, are having, you know, that's the, the trend we're seeing across the board is a lot of uh, projects trying to automate things um, with deep learning and, and uh, well, yeah, machine, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence projects that can automate a specific sector or a niche uh, industry. I think those will be a, a big wave here in the next uh, couple of years as well. How, however, regarding what you mentioned about uh, companies moving or being moved to the US, I think that we still have the mindset of that if you want to go big, really big, you need to go to, to Silicon Valley. And it's something that you can still feel on, on the ecosystem here in Barcelona. Alex? 
Well, I, the um, this kind of insurance technology, I mean, that's been happening for the past like several months, if not a year already, because we've seen some uh, kind of accelerators verticalize and go in insurance tech uh, in the US and in Europe, uh, most of them being run out of uh, either Germany or London or going to the US. Um, so that's probably happening. Uh, FinTech mostly played out, I think, at this point in time. Uh, I'm not a big believer in uh, blockchain. I mean, a lot of this stuff, um, kind of, if we're using Gartner stuff, we should have a kind of hype cycle and um, need to essentially, you know, a few years to, um, to stabilize. I mean, because there's a lot of experimentation, but it's not clear where things are going and we need to reach kind of deployment phase where it's actually something interesting that's going to build on top of this. Um, uh, Barcelona, Spain, sector-wise, uh, the strengths here uh, in terms of companies that we have here. I mean, we have this this wonderful chart, but we're talking mostly kind of e-commerce and fashion. That's where most of the money went into, and that's where um, we've seen some of the bigger exits. Um, and Europe-wide, uh, probably B2B software. Um, and that's kind of, I think, European strength because a lot of specifics about the size of the markets, the fragmentation of the markets in terms of the funds that can be raised here. And generally speaking, Europe is still, uh, kind of in my opinion, I'm not very optimistic, is still, for example, behind the US. I mean, especially when we're talking follow-on funding at like Series A, Series B, um, or say crowdfunding. Uh, statistically, we're looking at what, I mean, companies need to have been founded back in 2008, 2009, 2010 to be raising kind of AB rounds right now. So it's, and the size of the rounds is generally smaller. So um, the good thing is that the kind of the foundations for good ecosystem are happening. So, I mean, uh, there are, there is more money kind of Europe wide and Spain as well. Although, I mean, it's in a lot of good ways. I mean, we have governments getting into this. Uh, biggest investors like France is the French government. In Germany, it's the high-tech Grunderfunds, which is also very government-funded. Uh, here in Spain, I think Caixa Capital Risk, which is also essentially redistributing a lot of uh, public funds. Mm -hmm. um, so there's more money to go around. There's obviously uh, a lot of talented people. Um, and we have seen a lot of exits uh, and for, from like these companies and others that are, you know, it's people that have experience that, that are coming back, staying here and kind of sharing their experience, mentoring new founders, mentoring new startups. So, and that's kind of the fir third factor, but uh, we're still behind like the US and I mean, if we're talking Asia, it's a completely different world. Yeah, we raise our money from Japan, we, we all of, almost all of our rounds, though we have a lot of employees in um, um, Barcelona. So there are probably a few aspiring entrepreneurs or people that work at startups. I, I actually helped out with the funding pitch for my company as well. So what do you look for in a team? Because I met one VC who says, Susan, I meet 1,000 companies a year. I invest in one. So the odds were pretty tough with this particular individual, but what do you look for? Um, there's good engineers worldwide, there's good technologies globally, but what is it about the funding team or founding yeah. team? So I think the, the main topic is that we look for, and I think many VCs look for, is excellence. So I think you can describe it very, very shortly as excellence, but you want to look at the entrepreneurs and you want to see excellence in their background, in the way they interact with customers, in the way they interact with investors. Um, they want to see excellence, or you want to see excellence in the way they attract talent. And so if you see excellence across the board, then you feel like they might be the right entrepreneurs you want to back. And in my case, I, I have a personal exercise that I do to, uh, to, to try to find out if I would like to back the entrepreneurs is that I try to imagine them in a panel like this. Um, and I put mentally all the CEOs of our companies, of our portfolio companies, and I try to put them also in the panel with, with, the, with our current entrepreneurs. Kind of like and, a smackdown. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and then, exactly, and then I try to find out if uh, they would fit, if uh, they would be at the same level, if they would be um, part of the group. Um, and so this helps me, but it's a personal exercise. I don't think everybody does this. So, one question, Guillaume. And do you look as well like for that excellence among the interaction of the team? No, because maybe a team can be individually um, excellent, but not everyone fits with with each other. 
Um, yeah, but th that's right. It, this is usually something that they by themselves will sort out. So we as a, as a VC won't tell them who fits within the team. It's something they have to find out themselves. And they are, if they are smart, and usually they are, um, they will find out. So. Any input? Um, well, I mean, the t dynamics in a team is something that's very uh, challenging to kind of quantify. Um, having kind of gone through kind of accelerators and accelerators, different companies uh, in kind of past life, um, the team kind of, it, it's a feeling, it's something that's important because I have, for example, gone through, uh, through an accelerator at one point in time and there were like, you know, 10 companies going in and the takeout at the end of the whole thing was really that, I mean, ideas a dime a dozen, but at the end of the kind of the process, uh, I could build a super team that would then give an, kind of a good idea and a market opportunity could do whatever, whatever they wanted. So, um, but it's, uh, it's not very quantifiable in the sense that, you know, you can't put a, like a number on it. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I'm not an investor myself, and so when I speak about um, what to look for in a team, I think you look more at uh, what are some practical ways you can avoid disaster down the road, you know, and, and uh, as we mentioned, some of the, some of the companies in, in Barcelona have failed simply because of internal dynamics or problems with baggage in the, the cap table, the, the equity structure of the company, maybe the shareholders agreement wasn't well defined at the beginning, so you have a lot of kind of um, very... Uh, important stakeholders in this startup, not just the founders, sometimes it's early employees, sometimes it's early investors, who have a very different idea of success or a different, very different idea of what, what um, the, the exit plan might be come down the road. So, you know, whereas in the, the early stages, it's very exciting, you're getting traction, you're, you're raising some money. Um, in Spain, there was a, a time where if you were kind of, you know I, know, I know startups that have 29 different investors, you know, and they've only been around for like two years. <laughs> it's like, how did that happen? You know, how did you get 29 investors in two years? Um, and, and all those different parties have a say, you know, and, and, and they have a vote, or if the, the board of directors is very kind of mixed and people didn't all come from the tech world, some are restaurant investors, hotel, hotel, hoteliers, you know, they, they have a very different idea of growth and success than, than what maybe a, uh, a high scale, a high growth startup would, would typically go through. Um, and so I think um, making sure for, for future endeavors, future projects, just laying it out on the table as crystal clear as possible, making sure you're on the same page with your early, your early team through a, sh a written and, and no notarized shareholders agreement, I think is critical um, you know, in, in subsequent years. Yeah, so I want to open up for questions, actually. There were some people looking for advice, startup founders or people figuring out whether they want to work at a startup. Do you guys have questions that you want to ask? I'm going to call you, the poor gentleman in the middle. <laughs> Did you have your question, or you want to wait till we go underway before? Uh, behind you, actually. Well, I, mean, I don't have a specific <clears throat> question in mind. Uh, you know, for me, I'm here because I just want to expose myself to what's really happening in the startup space. How do founders, you know, go about, you know, embarking on this? You know, once you read a lot of blog articles, you, you get to, you know, recognize and appreciate how difficult and challenging it can be to, you know, uh, start a company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, just, you know, whatever experiences that you guys have had, some of the pain points that you had to go through, getting funding obviously is an important aspect, right? But uh, taking an idea and, and taking it to a point where you can create a company, how challenging was that for you, perhaps? Yeah, just to paraphrase, it's kind of like related to, you know, what's the best way to approach this investment community, going from, an, from a concept to, and, and what point too, because I actually worked with startup founders, and they said that you can either build the product, and then you have to build, like, you have to f completely focus on building, and then when you're fundraising, you have to completely focus on fundraising. So what, what's your advice on how to approach and when, right? I mean, I, I think I think in that approach, fundraising can actually be a detractor to your growth because you have yeah. to you have to take your eye off the ball for a little bit and you have to go uh, network. So I think I think the uh, ideal situation would be to always be fundraising, always be networking, always be meeting with investors and, and, and potential partners and and even even your vendors and service providers that you'll be partnering with and working with down the road. Just make sure those lines of communication are open so when you actually do need to 
open a conversation. It's a warm, it's a warm contact, not just a cold call. You know, like, like she said, investors are investing in maybe 1% of the projects they see every year, maybe. So, you know, you want to, you want to have some sort of rapport with them. Uh, and that when it comes time to raise money, you know, anticipate that it's going to take you two to three times longer than, than you thought, you know? So if you're thinking, okay, I'm going to give myself 90 days to raise this seed fund or, or, or this bridge, this bridge capital to get me to the next, the next stage. Well, it, it might take you more like six months or, or nine, you know? Um, and so, you know, if, if possible, I would, I would definitely say to try and kind of always have one, one eye on, on the fundraising. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I think, um, that's a very good point, but not only for fundraising, I think, it's important to always be connected to, yeah. to the community. So I think the best thing you can do is to always um, go to talk to entrepreneurs, VCs, business angels, and so on. Um, and this way, you will always learn how, how these guys think, how these guys interact with others. Um, and this is something that, as he said, it, it has to be done always. Even the companies that we backed, we asked the entrepreneurs to continue doing fundraising, not fundraising in the sense that they want us for money, but in the sense that they want to talk to people. And, and we also asked them to connect with the ecosystem where they are and talk to other entrepreneurs permanently. So I think that's the best thing you can do. Yeah, I cold call every Barcelona-based VC. No one returned my call or my email or the, you know, the contact form, not one. So I was able to connect with Startup Grind which, and, and Scott, which got me <laughs> Gil, and which got me Alex. So I, and I'm not fundraising, but it actually took a few uh, cycles. It's much better than a warm introduction. Yes. So in the end, you brought the key point for me, which is like having in mind that Everyone or behind everything, there is a person. No investors are 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 a person. <laughs> uh, your customers are are people as well, and like having a relation with them and making them aware that you're a person and and your and what are your strengths and and what you're doing. That's a key point for when you need it to be able to to get that. Alex, you've been a startup founder several times. Any um, secrets? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> fundraising is just like one part of it. And uh, for example, in Europe, um, there's some kind of nuances to fundraising uh, in terms of the metrics that the companies need to meet. And I think that's why we see companies formed in, for example, e-commerce and B2B spaces, because that's where you actually uh, can have cash flows at early stage. And um, where, whereas, you know, BTC markets developing them in Europe, uh, where you're not talking about like a homogenous uh, countries, I mean, everybody's a different language, different market size, etc. And the amount of money needed to be uh, kind of invested before you can actually get to revenue uh, is much higher. So, uh, and that's the kind of specificity of the local market, which is completely different than the US because they're talking, you know, 300 million people or I mean, China, which is like one point. I mean, I, nobody really knows. Um, so, but I mean, fundraising is just uh, part of it. It's a very time-consuming process. Uh, what we did um, in my companies is uh, we had split responsibilities between the founders. Uh, so, uh, whenever we fundraising, I mean, because uh, it's essentially a full-time job. Uh, it's very time consuming. So uh, if you're uh, in fundraising, the, like the last you know, three to whatever, six months when you're going through due diligence, uh, you're just on that. I mean, you're completely useless to your company, essentially. So that's uh, why it would be important to have a team for somebody who can actually focus on the business. Um, and I mean, just starting a company, it's, uh, it's a lot harder than people um, think it is. I think it's been glorified, it's become in vogue, uh, but I don't think people actually understand what it is. I mean, we pulled the plug on my last company because at some point we sat down and we realized that, I mean, there are some fundamental challenges in terms of technology and infrastructure um, in, in a vertical which is, was so big. I mean, as a startup, we would essentially have to uh, burn money for the next five years, wait for the deployment phase to kind of complete before we can actually do something meaningful, you know, and during the time we'd still be looking at whatever 70, 80 hour work weeks, there is all this uncertainty, um, and there's this like massive opportunity cost in, in doing startups that people do not realize until they're in it, you know, six, you know, 12 months in, and like, 
that's it. You cannot get out. <laughs> so uh, you're in it. So and I mean, circling back, I mean, you need, um, and that's where uh, there, you know, you get a lot of turbulence with investors. That's why it's actually you want to um, to have investors that are qualified, in the sense that they they know that they're investing in something that is exceptionally high risk because. Uh, investing in startups is a very high risk investment vehicle you know so uh, and most you know vcs do not perform well in terms of like returns because it, it's a challenging environment um so and uh bad investor can ruin a startup essentially um uh, same thing goes for founders for how you allocate equity uh, sweat equity whatever because roles change uh, so i mean just Having a cap table that makes sense, everybody overlooks it, especially first time founders. They're like, oh, we're all buddies, we're all friends, this is going to be wonderful, and we're going to change the world. Yeah. Um, like six to 12 months down the road, uh, regardless of whether things go well or poorly, in a sense, I mean, you raised around and everybody's like, it's amazing, we're going to change the world even more. Or um, if things are going poorly, and I mean, there's always struggles. I mean, something is always like, it's, it's a roller coaster. So um, there will be friction. So, and the best way to get around it is to have an agreement where um, there are kind of no bad feelings. And so, because at the end of the day, you want to remain friends, and something that will allow you to be flexible. So, in a sense, I mean, founders leave, teammates me leave, and I mean, you don't want to have that equity locked up. You want to give people a flexibility, and you also need to be able to relocate it to a new team member or to whomever. So, um, it's it's very very complex. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the thing. I was like, how long is this panel? <laughs> so, because uh, we can run a session on HR, uh, we can sure. run a session on like on yeah. growth and uh, like customer acquisition, which is also very kind of region sector specific. Um, some countries kind of in Europe and everything like we just I mean there, there's that you know slide that you know Barcelona is Silicon New Silicon Valley I'm like no it isn't okay. so uh, because I mean Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley Tel yeah. Aviv is Tel Aviv um, there are some things that, and I mean and Shanghai is Shanghai so there are some things that will work well in a particular region and aspiring uh, and I mean that's what happened um, you know for in, in Boston like in New England I mean um, back in what was it 70s 80s because it was the defense contractors and universities there that had cultures that allowed a particular ecosystem to develop over there uh, there were specific conditions in uh, Silicon Valley that allowed this industry to be developed there. Uh, they are conditions why is London for fintech and insurance tech? Well, remains to be seen for how long. It's because of specific conditions because it is the financial center. Um, same thing goes for and trying to force it. I mean, we've seen it attempted and tried. Um, it's, uh, I don't think it works. I mean, it's, it's some way, at some point, we need to understand that uh, they are market conditions, cultural, whatever they might be, that are uh, conductive to certain types of companies to be founded there, because there's certain uh, you know talent available, or there's certain uh, you know social, economic dynamics, demographics, whatever it might be. Um, because I mean, trying to build um, I don't know uh, like Instagram or some very heavily oriented consumer company, like for example in Barcelona. I mean, I, I, I would struggle to justify it without, you know, financial backing or something because it's, it's essentially a very small market, you know. Um, same thing goes for, like, I guess I was in Japan recently. It's a, also a very specific market and how it operates. Yep. And some things work and some things don't. Yeah, so we, um, my company is um, headquarters in Switzerland, but it actually started in Japan. And um, in Japan, they were eager to put models, the Japanese government is eager to put Japanese uh, startups into the global scene actually. Um, and maybe we're like the guinea pig as well. Because in the Japan market, it's um, the threshold for IPO is a lot lower. I think it's only 10 million US or something. So it's pretty easy to accomplish 10 million in US and put yourself on the Nikkei stock exchange or something. So that's why I was going to ask a question about the political scene, right? So does Brexit affect the investment? Because I met a startup founder that had some discussions with uh, a UK VC, and it, all, it literally fell flat, um, which is bad luck on his part. But does that affect your investments or anything like that? Or do you see any effect on, on what's for happening? Us, for us, it's zero. Oh, zero okay. effect. 
we have a team in London and we're going to be investing in London for forever, regardless what the politicians say, because um, it, politics does not really affect much the performance of startups in the end. First, they are mobile. They can go anywhere they want. Software is everywhere and nowhere. Um, so, and, and if, if before the Brexit, uh, England was an attractive market. Uh, before, after the Brexit, it's still going to be an attractive market. So, yeah, I think I think there was an initial shock uh, when when that news um, broke, and and I think just just in general, business business people, investors uh, of any kind, they kind of don't like uncertainty. They don't like, you know, it's, it's, that, that's something that will have a kind of a knee-jerk reaction. So we definitely saw that. We also saw a couple of cities lining up trying to take over the FinTech Capital Award. Uh, you know, Berlin was actually hiring buses to drive around London and say, hey, um, keep calm and move, move your startup to Berlin. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I know Frankfurt's making a play. Amsterdam might be a natural place for it to be a, a, a FinTech Capital. Obviously, Barcelona had a nice write-up in Financial Times last week. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but um, Financial Times covered Barcelona as a possible uh, fintech capital. This week it was Madrid doing some PR. So, um, you know, I think some of the cities are trying to, to you know, scrape some of the, some of the juicy, uh, you know, benefits from that. But, I, you know, like, like I think, you know, in the end, um, you know, startups are, are, they're adaptable. And, uh, and depending on your situation and the industry you're, you're, you're performing in, you know, it's going to more or less uh, affect it specific to your case. So we have a lot of employees, uh, engineers um, in, in Barcelona because there's a good university network. And I think even the Docker guys were um, hiring out of their old school Epitech. And so um, do you see that as an advantage for European startups? And, and I, I had uh, hired some people from Eastern, Eastern Europe as well. Um, is that an advantage? Is like the more effective use of labor, uh, keep your costs down? Or what are the tips for startup founders? I would say that costs, of course, are, are is an advantage, and especially in a city like Barcelona, that compared to the rest of Europe, is is pretty affordable. Uh, but I would say more. No, Barcelona is a place um, that everyone or 99% of the people likes. Probably Alex uh, and Scott can answer in a while why they they came here. No, and did they? their business here, but everyone or most of the people like to be here. So if you base your company here or you have an office with engineers here, it's easy to convince them. No, you probably with the same salary tell someone to go to Stockholm or to Barcelona. Um, I think that 90% of the people could choose a city like this one. No? So quite, uh, a good quality uh, of life uh, is something very important. Like farther than, than the costs itself. Maybe now you can let us know why you came here. Yeah. Uh, certainly quality of, uh, of life had a, had a major, was a major factor in choosing Barcelona. Um, it also has a great uh, gr um, group of uh, MBA and business programs. Um, so there's definitely talent coming out the years, every year, it's graduating 100,000 students at least, engineering students, PhDs, MBAs, you know, they're, they're coming from all around the world to, to Barcelona to study. Uh, hopefully we can retain some of that talent here in Barcelona, uh, unfortunately due to some strict visa laws and, and restrictions that they, they tend to leave. Also, the salaries low, that's good from a perspective of a founder, but it's bad from a perspective of, of an employee, right? So, you know, there's loyalty, there's, there's churn, there's the retainment, you know, you're going to lose, you know, if you're paying bottom level salaries, you're going to lose your best talent because they're going to eventually leave you for a higher paying job. So um, we would like to actually see the, the bar raised a little bit there, especially if a, you know, if a Facebook or a Google were to open offices here, they would just, they would just snatch the top cream of the crop, 10% and come, come wow. over work for us, kind of like King.com did when they came. <laughs> um, but, um, but in general, on a, you know, on a more philosophical, global, economic vision we're heading into, we're going towards a gig economy. We're moving towards a freelance economy. We're moving towards everything as a service economy. So um, as we move that way and as people can kind of work from anywhere and, and technology allows us to be very remote and geographically agnostic, I think Barcelona is only going to get more popular because if you think about as a founder perspective, you're going to spend the next five to ten years easy in your next venture. So you have to start thinking like, okay, where do I want my, where do I want to raise my kids? Where do I want to have a family? Where do I want to live for the next five to ten years? And I think that, you know, 
the minute you don't need to be in London to do your project, you don't need to be in Silicon Valley, I think Barcelona becomes very, very attractive. And, and I think we're moving more and more in that direction. Um, I mean, Barcelona is, I mean, it's a wonderful city. I mean, we have amazing weather, like 300 and something days of sunshine, but that I'm not sure the attendees managed to experience because it was <laughs> cloudy and raining. Um, so, um, so, and I mean, the quality of life is very good. Um, there are some wonderful universities in the city. And I mean, we started a university here and we're actually bringing talent from Eastern Europe to, to teach and transform. So, um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, so it, it's a great city. So I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, let's not you know kind of fool ourselves. Um, so uh, the foundation is good. I mean, I prefer like you know Barcelona to San Francisco. So because I mean, you can't swim in the ocean. So but, you know, uh, um, and uh, but I mean. Garam said, I mean, you know, startups don't care about the government. I tend in some ways to disagree with that because um, like in a highly regulated industries, okay, regulation plays a tremendous role because I've been on the sidelines of um, kind of number 26 when they were trying to get their licenses done uh, in Germany and it was a nightmare. So, um, so some, I mean, but that's going back to, you know, environment being much more conductive to certain types of businesses. So, and if you're in a regulated environment, which would be, you know, anything medical related insurance tech, FinTech or something like that. I mean, you have to play by the rules and you can't just, you know, run and be innovative. I mean, that whole thing about, you know, uh, um, move, fast and move fast, fast and break things. I mean, that is, but I mean, you can be shut down overnight essentially. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and if you are at the point where you have X number of employees, you have some fixed cost and you're shut down by the government um, while you're litigating, which also costs money, um, I mean, you just might run out of money, as uh, simple as that. Um, so I lost my train of thought over there. So, but I mean, no, Barcelona is wonderful. There's, uh, there's, it's, it's a great foundation. Uh, with, I mean, I'd like to see much more companies here. Uh, and I'd like, I mean, there's been a lot of talk from the government about changing regulation, making it uh, easier to set up companies here, hire employees, et cetera. And, and there is a problem with retaining a lot of the talent that comes here to study universities because a lot of those people still go back. So, um, and that needs to come from the government so they make it easy for these people who have graduated with an engineering degree from, from somewhere to stay in Barcelona, to work in a company in Barcelona. So, because if they go back to, I don't know, wherever they live in the world, well, I mean, great. So, because Barcelona is, I think, the, the second um, kind of in terms of number of students' destinations of popularity by student destination in the world after London, like as a city. So, I mean, there's a lot of people coming here to study. So, just not a lot of people staying. Um, were, was there some questions out in the audience? Go, please no, go I ahead, wanted sir. to yeah. add yeah. something yeah, like regarding what, what you mentioned uh, regarding governments and their paper. Of course, in Europe, they have a much bigger role than in USA, and luckily, I would say. Uh, but talking uh, about Barcelona specifically, I think that the city council is doing a great job in this in this sense because they are like doing a lot of things but not trying to do them on their own but um, supporting the private sector that do all these initiatives that are coming out in Barcelona and these startups and supporting them and not just trying to do their thing and 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 mm, with their vision still there is a long way to go and talking about the things of Barriers. We have the example of Cantox, no? that is a super successful company from Barcelona, but they actually had to found to the company in London, because otherwise probably they wouldn't be legal yet if they had waited to be allowed to operate from, from here. So you're talking about Skyscanner, right? Sorry? Skyscanner? Uh, well, that was Cantox, but Skyscanner is in, uh, I think, the Scottish company. Yeah. Oh, I thought Skyscanner was Barcelona. They, no, they have a big <laughs> dev team here. Oh, yeah. but, okay. but they, I think the headquarters are in Scotland. I see. Okay. So, so I think that Cantor is an interesting example because all fit, well, not all fintech companies, but most of the companies that are VC-backed in the fintech space are willing to be international. So then it's not about caring about what one government says, but caring about what all the governments say, and everyone has its own opinion. So in the end they say, you know what, fuck. 
I will go out, and if they don't, if they shut us down, then we go to the next country. And that's what they do. Um, that's what happened with Kendrick, and what's, what's going to happen with Blah Blah Car, what happened with, with Uber, and so that's how it works. So there's a saying in the Silicon Valley, you know, something like uh, annual recovering, oh, I say, I say, misspoke, monthly recurring revenue. They're talking about like two million US dollars per month. Is that the same bar in Barcelona or Spain? If it's lower, I'm going to move my company over here. <laughs> because Storm Ventures, I used to do this panel, uh, Jason Lemke talks about two, because they've gotten used to all these, they've gotten spoiled basically by these, you know, these, these home runs, right? They're looking for like two million monthly recurring revenue. And frankly, if you had two million monthly recurring revenue, that means you need 10x the pipeline. That means you have a $20 million pipeline every month. I don't know of anyone that can do that. And so what, what's the bar in Barcelona money-wise? Well, yeah, I think it depends very much on the, on the stage. Uh, so some VCs invest in certain stages and they have different bars. It, depend, it depends on the industry to some extent because monthly recurring revenue is for software, but in case of transactional or e-commerce business, it's a bit different. Um, I don't think anybody in Spain has a bar at 2 million MRR because this, this is probably a bar that is from maybe or four VCs like Excel or Index that are in, in London and come from time to time to Barcelona to invest. But because you don't have many companies uh, reaching these levels. Um, per year or so. Uh, there was a question here. Yeah, um, entrepreneuring in Europe, it sometimes it seems to some of us that you know, uh, European small companies might be like one nil behind even before the game starts because of the huge domestic market that the U.S. has. And you start off with a potential market of 320 million. And if you're unlucky and you start in Estonia, you start off with 350,000. Might be a bit more lucky if you're in England or Germany. Um, how do you guys look at that challenge for European startups and even small companies operating internationally and with domestic pressures? You European may want to. Yeah. Okay. It. Uh, <laughs> it was it was good. Yeah. Well, I think Estonia has done it pretty well, right? Yeah, Despite yeah. being a small market, because they have quite a couple of very big companies. It so it's hard to you know, grow fast. So, so I, I, would, I would challenge this. I'm not sure that having all your customers in the US uh, makes it easier for you than having them, some of them in Spain, some of them in France, some of them in, in Italy. Um, I know the language is a barrier, but to some extent, all the customers speak English, um, at least. I wish. Plus, you get your taxi illegally. Well, the main thing is you get a good client here, a good client is a whole different dimension than getting a good client in the States, um, revenue-wise. Well, I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really agree. No. no I think uh, most of our companies grow from Spain, then go to Europe, and then go to the US. Um, and they don't find big differences between the kind of customers they find in Europe, in different countries, or in the US. So um, I, I think to some extent, the kind of customers that our startups have are um, very international, have, have been to some extent in many different countries. Um, so I, I would say that startups live probably in a different level than the hyper-local level that some companies in different countries might be. Um, and especially because of uh, being able to sell it from as, as a service, um, hosted in the cloud, uh, you have zero, very low friction to selling anywhere in the world. So um, I, I'm pretty optimistic about uh, Europe, um, and I don't feel it's too fragmented or too small for growing startups. Alex, did you have an opinion? And I'll take a question right after that. Oh, I have oh, I an opinion. I, I, I always have an opinion. Um, so. Uh, my opinion is that having a large starting market is obviously an advantage. Um, uh, selling even B2B SaaS in Europe uh, to different countries, even though you're in the cloud, uh, there are friction points because, for example, you cannot sell something in German in English. You need to localize it to German. Yeah, otherwise, I mean, they will not buy it. And, and Germany is kind of the Europe's largest market. Um, 
So, and I also find that um, sales cycles and the sales process in the U.S., like or just like an Anglo-Saxon world, is uh, is different, and I find it faster in terms of, uh, at least from experience of about like two, two, three SaaS companies, I find it faster, much easier to close deals, uh, slightly different ticket uh, ticket sizes. Um, well, again, depends on the vertical sector and everything, but there, it's easier to convert an American customer than it would be to convert an European customer similarly. Um, and there is also like specificity in ser selling in certain regions uh, in terms of even developing in Salesforce, because um, uh, again, uh, it may not uh, matter as much when you're say like at a freemium self service sign up uh, process, but once you start to move up into like mid-market enterprise, uh, it's like you need to develop inside sales. That means local local knowledge, team on the ground, uh, and you also like in. You know, I don't know if it's still the case. I haven't sold anything in France in ages. Like regulation about having uh -huh. to like establish a company and a team there and just run a lot of this stuff. And at some point you're like, really, for a whatever 60, 70 million market. Um, so and yeah, so and then you kind of it's it re, it does help a lot to, because um, again there's the story of uh, I the name of the Barcelona company that was Hotel Tonight before Hotel Tonight was a thing has uh, been forgotten, but I mean they started in Barcelona they had the idea first uh, uh, and then uh, Hotel Tonight started much later in the U.S. But by the time that hotel the local company died, Hotel Tonight was on their E round. So, um, which was in the space of two, three years. There I mean, that's like an outlier example, but it does help. Mm -hmm. so. so, if there's a question there, and then I'll let so the panelists do some closing thoughts. Just really quick, do you all have engineering backgrounds? That's question number one. And question number two, if I were to move to Barcelona tomorrow, how would you advise me to connect with these ecosystems of startups and uh, VC? Uh, I, I do not have an engineering background, the question number one. Um, question number two, um, Barcelona is very open and inclusive in general. It's, it's a very international city. It's a very uh, transient city. People are constantly coming and going for business or otherwise. Um, I think the, the best and fastest way to get involved in the, the local tech and startup community is to be a part of it and to go to events and to network your ass off. And, and within a few months um, of really going to the meetups, finding your kind of people, uh, Barcelona is, is an outlier when it comes to meetup groups. I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with meetup.com. Barcelona has, I think, the leading market for meetups in all of Europe, and it's in Barcelona, it's larger than all of Spain meetups combined, uh, just in Barcelona. Uh, meetup is one, of our, is one of our clients, that's how I know that. And so um, they, they are fascinated by Barcelona. They don't understand. They're trying, to, they're trying to mimic Barcelona's rapid adoption of meetup to the rest of Europe. And um, for us, that works as a super fast in, because you can find your group of people and the subjects you want to learn about and be a part of and get in and be a, become an organizer, become a, just a collaborator and just go to these events. Within a couple of weeks or months, you're going to start seeing the same faces, meeting the same people. Everybody in Barcelona is about one degree removed uh, from each other. We've all met before, um, even though we don't work together or anything. It's, it's a kind of a little cozy ecosystem and, and uh, you can, you know, it's growing rapidly. There's a lot of hype around it right now. and, and as um, you know, as um, Carlos said, it's the city's done a great job to brand itself as this innovation capital, this smart city world capital, the mobile world capital, the IoT is here right now. You know, I mean, like they've done a great job kind of branding it as a as an overall um, you know great place to to start companies. I think you just kind of have to get involved. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to let uh, each of the panelists give some closing thoughts, advice for aspiring entrepreneurs or people who want to work in Barcelona. So Guillaume, you can go first. Okay. So, so the first, just, just answering also your question, the first thing I think you could do is to uh, sign up for his group, for Carlos' group, because uh, it's uh, very, very popular and you can find a lot of people there involved in the ecosystem. Um, and in general, for any entrepreneur going to found his company in Barcelona, um, I think I would repeat the same thing that I, I mentioned before, um, which goes in line with, with his thought. Um, it's a very open community. You can come here and talk to everybody. So, so use this because people are going to give you advice and you're going to learn a lot from many different players in the ecosystem and will explain you how things work. Um, and it's pretty transparent and, and accessible. Um, 
So that this would be my advice. But cold calling didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe, one point. <laughs> maybe one point. Um, I, I myself accept every LinkedIn invitation, wow. just by, by default. Um, and actually, when I get one LinkedIn invitation and they want to talk, then usually I have a call. So, so this you could have tried that. Um, I was just wasn't so, smart enough. I used so, the web page. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but good. I think I think many people are are just open here. Mm. Alex, any advice, closing advice before they pull us off? No, I mean, Barcelona is, yeah, uh, Barcelona is a wonderful city. Um, it's gotten much more international over the course of the last, like, you know, decade or say 15 years. I think the, the most recent statistics is about 17% of uh, people living in the city are expats or from somewhere else, compared to, I think it was like one or 2% in 2000s. Um, so the ecosystem is growing. Um, so there's, there, there are VCs, there are wonderful startups, there is a lot of talent, there are universities, the weather wonderful, the food is amazing, and the wine is even better. Um, so, uh, and um, I think it would be even better if, I mean, if more people actually moved here and kind of lived the dream and uh, tried to make it uh, the best place that it can be. Uh, Scott, real quick. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, in, on a general note, you know, on like re like relentlessly focus on your product and on your value proposition and your and your your target your clients your users right and and by doing that you're going to refine your pitch your your value to the your benefit to the people you're trying to to serve with your with your startup with your idea and then what you also do is you get better at communicating that to people and the more people you talk to the better you get and the, and the better you get, the more people know how to help you. So when, you're, when you can explain what you're doing in one or two sentences and what you're looking for in one brief sentence, people know how to help you. And the second they know how to help you, you're top of mind. And so when they meet somebody who you might be looking for, you're, they already have you crystal clear in their mind of who they can connect you with. And I think um, that's kind of just a general thing with your projects. You can do this now while you're, while you're working in other jobs. On the side, a lot of the best startups come from side projects, from things people tinkering on the weekends and the evenings and, and building things one of Barcelona's best companies, uh, Red Booth, started as a side project. Okay. And uh, I think Sorry. that's the end for us. Sorry. Yeah, Carlos, um, one more <laughs> thought and then that'd be it. Like, I, I'd like to say, like, I think that all the factors that we mentioned about Barcelona and Europe, like, relate somehow to people, no? Talent, life quality, uh, good wine. <laughs> uh, so uh, in, the, uh, in the end, if you put the focus on people, uh, that's the that's a way to succeed, no? Because people will be what will be your customers, our people, your team, our people. So Barcelona is okay. a city where you can find good people. So thank you. I want to thank the panelists, and um, we wanted to showcase the VCs and the investment community and the startup community in Barcelona because it's unlikely open stack will ever. You know, we don't repeat cities. So thank you. It's kind of a once in a lifetime thing, <laughs> and uh, you know, enjoy Barcelona. <laughs> thank and you. thanks for thank uh, attending.